Und ich freue mich vor allen Dingen, dass Professor Peter Bayer hier ist. Herr Bayer ist Professor für Religionswissenschaft an der Universität in Ottawa und hat seine Schwerpunkte in der Religionssoziologie und beschäftigt sich mit Fragen von Religion und Globalisierung sowie Religion und Immigration. Er hat eine ganze Reihe von Artikeln und Büchern veröffentlicht, vielleicht mit zwei der wichtigsten Bücher, die vielleicht auch einigen bekannt sind. Das ist zum einen Religions and Global Society und <lacht> Religions and Globalization, was dann auch wieder zeigt, wo seine Forschungsschwerpunkte liegen. Aktuell ist Herr Bayer in einem großen Forschungsprojekt aktiv, zur religiösen Diversität in Kanada. Und wenn ich das richtig gesehen habe, wird dieser Vortrag jetzt auch mit diesem Projekt zumindest in Verbindung stehen. Mit ähnlichen Projekten. Ähnlichen Projekten. Gut. Dein Publikum. Nochmal vielen Dank, dass du da bist. Bitte. Also ich, ich spreche zwar Deutsch, aber ich habe dies auf Englisch geschrieben, also werde ich Englisch sprechen oder wenigstens Englisch vorlesen, also eine echte Vorlesung. Uh, I'm going to give uh, little titles as I go along. I decided not to do the obligatory overhead, uh, so just so that you can tell where I am in my presentation, uh, I'll uh, pause every now and again and give you a little title to tell you when I'm switching subjects a bit. So I begin with um, Uh, global migration and globalization uh, in the post-World War II context, just to set the context. For complex reasons, the world after the end of the Second World War was a different world than it had been only a decade before. What we now call globalization received a significant acceleration, both in terms of actual global connections and in terms of awareness. Of course, this change took a while to manifest itself with any clarity, But with hindsight, we can see that the changes began right away and probably had already begun during the war itself. One of these was an at first very hesitant, but then accelerated opening of more and more parts of the world to a greater mobility of resources and communication, of course, but also of people. Global migration has been a feature of our world in all times, and the latter half of the 20th century is not exceptional in that sense, but it is in terms of the range of such migration its density in the sense of the number and volume of migratory trajectories, and in terms of the sheer number of people involved. Only th some of this is attributable to the fact that the world had just so many more people. Most of it is a matter of the ability to migrate, motivation to migrate, and receptivity to migration. All parts of the world have been involved, whether predominantly as sending, or as receiving regions, or both. The dominant core regions of the world, including Western Europe, North America, and the British colonist societies of Oceania, have been among the, most, uh, the more important receiving regions, even if the first of these, that is Western Europe, was also an important sending region. It sent me, for instance, to Canada. <coughs> Next topic, the difference of the new migration, uh, that it is non-European. What, was, uh, what, what this short preamble is meant to establish is that the countries of Western Europe, including Germany, and the two rich North American ones, including Canada, in this context are members of a set. They should therefore be comparable when we delve more deeply into the consequences of this post-World War II global migration. To translate this immediately, that means, for instance, that all these countries became the recipients of what is sometimes called migration from quote-unquote, non-traditional sources. The sources were not just different. The people who came as migrants were, to a significant uh, degree, from regions of the world that were not in any sense 
Western or European, meaning that they posed a different set of challenges in states that over the previous century had developed as nation states. Nations in these cases were substantially ethnically slash civilizationally and even religiously conceived, and these self-conceptions were central to the normative orders established in these states. It is, after all, a large part of the reason why, or why, why they entered into such destructive wars with one another twice in the previous 30 years. To put this more harshly and simplistically, the new challenge of the new migrants was that they weren't white or Christian, often neither. Now, the effects of the new migration, migrant populations. The new migrants presented all sorts of challenges that were not directly identity related, although the understanding of those challenges has often come to be seen as so related. Thus, there have been questions such as how the newcomers could be integrated into the national economy, essentially what jobs would they do, what sort of political place they would have in local, regional, and national governing structures, what sorts of contributions they would make uh, to cultural production, such as media, artistic, and culinary life of the nation, what sorts of family and social relations they would establish, their patterns of marriage, divorce, and reproduction, their gender relations. What will be their prevailing moral and other normative orientations, and would these be similar or different from the patterns of such orientation in the old population? What kind of social problems would they introduce or exacerbate? What would their effect be on rates, uh, rates or kinds of crime and deviance? Would their presence and how they settled into a country have an effect on that country's international relations and national images, both worldwide and with respect to the sending countries and regions? How would they affect the urban landscapes of the cities in which they settled? And given the nature of the Western countries at this time, they would settle overwhelmingly, especially in the large cities. And finally, not least, given the focus of my presentation today, what effect would they have on the religious composition and landscape of the countries in which they were establishing themselves? I list all these dimensions of what we often now call the question of immigrant integration, both to show the complexity of the situation and to point indirectly to how all these questions could be and often were understood in identity terms. The answers to all the questions could be and often have been phrased in terms like, quote, it is because they are X, Y, Z that they behave, do, settle, and the way that they do, especially in the ways that they behave, do, and settle differently than we perceive the old, not old population to do. Now to the significance of the second generation. It is in this context that the children of the migrants, generally known as the second generation, present these issues of the challenges of integration in physical and sometimes dramatic form. The children of the migrants, and this must include those who, although not born in the country, arrived at a young enough age that they were effectively socialized there, people like me. Uh, eh, eh, um, the children of these migrants are, including these people, are in a real sense from here, that is the new country. They are natives, but they also are members of families that are from elsewhere. And then, in this sense, they are boundary crossers, or at least likely to be understood and very often understand themselves as such. Moreover, whether migration to a country takes place episodically, say in response to economic cycles or refugee crises else, elsewhere in the world, or whether it is an ongoing affair of national policy, eventually the second generations are, and beyond are going to become an ever-increasing proportion and eventually, eventually the bulk of the migrant-originated population. In other words, they represent the vector of this issue into the future more clearly than do their first-generation parents and family members. Now, the question of integration with respect to the second generation. There is perhaps no better way to illustrate the critical place of the second generation in this issue than to ask the question of integration with respect to them. It is a question that is often asked. Given that the second generation consists of natives of the country, what does it mean to ask whether or not they are integrated? Assuming that the question of identity, including national identity, is central in this context, and I am assuming that, a core part of the answer will consist in whether or not the old population will accept them, 
will consider them as people who are from and belong here in this country as opposed to elsewhere, namely the country of origin, the countries of origins uh, of their families. On the other side, of course, is whether they will or will not consider themselves as such. So, from the beginning, the question of integration of the second generation, as of the first, by the way, is going to be a question of identity and recognition, a matter of attitudes. And connected with this will be all the other dimensions of the challenge that the migrants present in the first place, as I have just outlined. Questions of economic, political, cultural, and social integration. What sort of, sorts of jobs will they have and what will be their level of income? Will they involve themselves in the politics of the country, as voters especially, but also eventually as public figures? Will their value orientations resemble those of the rest of the population? Will their social networks be mixed or restricted to their own attributed group? Will their consumption patterns be similar or different? What will be, visions, what will be uh, the visions for their own future, including with respect to how they will found and continue families, what sorts of media and other transnational lives they will lead? Will they come to hold power positions in proportions commensurate with their numbers? What sort of religious identities and levels of involvement in religion will they show? And questions of this sort. Now, to talk about integration between assimilation and difference. If, however, one takes the situation of the second generation seriously, one will have to ask why the question of integration should be asked of them at all. After all, they are natives of the country, and we do not generally ask the question of integration of people born and raised here. We might ask other questions, such as whether a new generation will find its place, whether it will experience inclusion and well-being, or exclusion and alienation, and which subgroups will experience which outcomes. All the potential challenges or problems which the immigrants present with respect to belonging, economic, political, cultural, and social integration except here read as inclusion, would apply to any given new indigenous cohort, perhaps because they are also in a real sense new to the country. But we, we would usually not use the language of integration, let alone assimilation with respect to them. A youth gone astray is not asked why she or he has not assimilated or integrated, but rather what prevented him or her from avoiding the path of deviance and becoming a social problem. We can conclude from this that when we ask the question of whether the second generation is integrating or has integrated, we are asking the question of inclusion, but in a way that assumes that inclusion will depend on successfully bridging a presumed gap between their inherited, quote unquote, foreign identity and the possibility of, quote unquote, becoming one of us. Thus, for instance, we may rather typically interpret what otherwise might be seen as a generation gap, as one generation or cohort not, um, not growing up with quite the same values, orientations, goals, and other characteristics as the previous generation, as instead a case of people who are caught between two worlds, which are assumed to be somewhat incommensurate, and further that problems encountered can be interpreted as a result of the difficulty of reconciling the two. If you know the literature on this stuff, this will be all recognizable because this is the kind of language that gets used. Something similar can be said about understanding the distinctive patterns of identity and life orientations of the second generation. What sorts of difference will they be allowed to show without being accused of maintaining foreignness and thus not being integrated? If, for instance, a, sec a second gener absorbs the popular culture uh, and at, at any given time prevalent in a country, everything from artistic taste and styles to dress to orientation towards sports and religion, then she may be considered well integrated. But if he watches television from back home, dresses like someone from there, or in the Canadian case follows soccer rather than hockey, then his or her level of integration may be questioned. If a member of the same generational cohort who is from an old established family does the same, then that will at most be seen as perhaps a bit odd, but most likely not as excluded and alienated. With respect to religion, that might be the sort of difference that would apply to a second generation person who adopts, for instance, the local form of Christianity, a sign of integration, versus another ancestrally established local who converts to Islam, 
Perhaps a bit unusual, but not a question of integration. Now asking about the integration of everyone. Another way of approaching this issue is to ask whether the categories and criteria of integration could be applied to everyone in a given age and generational cohort. If not just a member of the second generation, but anyone in his or her cohort could end up being considered not integrated because of certain of their orientations, attitudes, and behaviors with regard to their economic, political, cultural, and social inclusion, then it would be logical to ask the integration question also of the second generation. If, however, sorry, that's the problem of reading a text. Your mouse jumps. If, however, orientations, attitudes, and behaviors that are exhibited by a range of people are interpreted in terms of integration only for the second and 1.5 generation of immigrants and not of their older population contemporaries, then we can only conclude that the issue with respect to the former is not primarily, or at least not only, one of inclusion or exclusion, but instead of, instead or in addition, also one of attributed foreignness that they have inherited as a result, a result uh, as a kind of an essential identity in which if they are to be included in a society, they will have to overcome by becoming more native than the natives. That would, of course, become all the more difficult if the attributed foreignness includes visible characteristics, especially those that simply cannot be changed. Such a person might really have to really act white if they are to be considered integrated, and even that might not be enough. Now, move to the second generation in Canada as a kind of a case study. On the basis of these introductory and theoretical considerations, I want now to flesh out this issue by looking at the concrete situation of a particular second 1.5 generation issued from post-World War II non-traditional immigrants, namely those in Canada. I do this on the basis of data gathered from two research projects that I and others conducted in that country between 2004 and 2010. The specific aim of these projects was to examine religion among the young adults of immigrant families, specifically how they were relating to the religions of their family heritages or not. Along the way, the question of their situation in Canadian society was inevitably raised, since as part of examining their religious lives, or lack thereof, we found out a great deal about how the rest of their lives were being lived. This included how they saw themselves in terms of Canadian society, and how they felt that society regarded them. People from a wide variety of religious backgrounds participated in some 300 individual interviews and some 35 focus groups, and these include those from a variety of Christian as well as from Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, Sikh, and no religion backgrounds. The largest group were from Christian or Muslim families. A small but significant number came from ethnically and religiously mixed families, they ranged in age from 18 to their early 30s and included men and women whose families came from a great many different countries around the world and had arrived in Canada after that country's change in immigration policies in 1967. They were recruited in five large urban centers from right across the country and included both those whose dominant language was English and French. All of them were born or grew up in Canada. Our cutoff age was actually 11 at the time of arrival and the vast majority of them had completed or were in the process of completing post-secondary education, mostly university. Now I'm going to deal with a variety of profiles and the broad conclusions with respect to this question of integration. Not surprisingly, the most evident result of the research is that there exists a tremendous variety of outcomes, including with respect to the questions of how well, quote unquote, integrated the participants were in Canadian society in which they lived. By and large, however, the least one can say is that taking into consideration their stage of life, their average and median age was in fact in their early 20s, undergraduates as it were, the vast majority declared themselves and showed all the indicators, indicators of being very well integrated, above all in terms of their educational attainment, in terms of the social relation, their social relations and networks, in terms of their cultural orientations and declared values, and in terms of their subjective feelings of belonging. In other words, staying away from the language of integration, foreignness, and assimilation, the great majority was and felt included 
as, quote unquote, full and equal members of Canadian society. This is actually a question we pose them. Do you think that this is what you are? And they considered that, in spite of, this, of certain insufficiencies and problems, Canada was an excellent country in which to live and a wel welcoming one for themselves and their immigrant families. In most respects, they seemed to be like others in their age and generational cohort, whether of recent immigrant families or from families that had already been in the country for generations. But now for some qualifiers. Having stated this broad conclusion, a number of qualifiers need to be introduced which show the situation and the answer to the core questions I am posing to be significantly more complex than this simple statement makes it appear to be. First, with respect to representativeness, given that these were qualitative research projects, no claim can be made that the participants were representative of their populations in the st statistical sense of constituting a random sample. On the other hand, from what we know from research into these populations that claim such representativeness, they are probably broadly representative in the sense of representing among themselves most of the prevalent profiles that exist among the second and 1.5 generation members of post-1970 immigrant families. Just to give an example, it is the case that the vast majority of their population in Canada receives post-secondary education, whether at the technical college or a technical or applied college or at the university level. Moreover, the significant majority claim, the significant majority claim to feeling like they belong in Canada is also one that is reproduced in the quantitative research with its randomized and stratified samples. Something similar can be said for the professions on which they are embarking and then on their general income level, as well as some of the value orientations and attitudes. Nonetheless, it must be said that the research most definitely missed capturing many of those whose presence is much smaller in their population, people, for instance, who are high school dropouts, who are marginalized, including that small number that has taken the path of violence, extremism, um, and total alienation, who have, for instance, become, uh, come to take part in terrorist movements or have joined urban gangs or the ranks, ranks of those labeled deviant and criminal. But even in this regard, they might show themselves to be not that different from others in their cohort, cohort who are not of immigrant families. The latter's rates of sub-average educational attainment, social and economic marginalization, alienation, deviance, and criminality is not significantly different, and in comparison to various of the subgroups in the second generation, probably somewhat higher. In other words, we could say if we're integrated, these people seem to be more integrated than the average. In some respects, however, it must be said that the majority of this second and 1.5 generation of immigrant families is disadvantaged in that it is the target of a particular form of exclusion. Here I speak of the issue of races, racism and, the basis, and other bases of discrimination. The decided majority of our research populations come from what in Canada are called visible minorities. People who by their physical appearance are not visibly not of European origins. Like much of their research, by the way, nobody ever asks me where I come from. And I didn't come from Canada. But if I looked East Asian and I was there for three generations, you know this here too, I was simply asked, where do you come from? Right? That's what I mean here. So these visible Nordic people who would play physical appearance that aren't European. Like much other research, ours shows that a significant proportion of the second and 1.5 generation have experienced or have direct knowledge of discrimination against themselves or people, for instance, for example, their relatives, very much like them, on the basis of these visible differences. There exists, moreover, an apparent color gradient to the frequency and harshness of these experiences in Canada. The darker one's skin, the more likely one is to be a target. Among, among other things, this means that such discrimination largely has a racial, here meaning skin color, base, a fact that is confirmed by both our and other research. The most common reason given by people for the basis of the discrimination that they have seen and faced is that it is racially motivated. Perceived discrimination on the basis of especially religion is far less prevalent even among visible Muslims and Sikhs, for instance. Nonetheless, with the exception of people who are seen as quote-unquote black, 
Most of our participants and those in other research uh, considered that such racism occurs, in the first instance, infrequently. It is a rare occurrence for most of them, according to the majority of the population, of the people who are its target. And also that it is, for the most part, not particularly worrisome. This is an oddity. Often reports of such discrimination refer only to experiences in childhood or in elementary school, or they are written off as the unfortunate presence of a few ignorant people, not as something that is simply endemic to the society of which these people, uh, in sizable majority, feel themselves a normal part. Even the particular case of Islamophobia in the wake of 9-11 is more often something that those affected interpreted as a relatively temporary difficulty. Even only three years later, when we started our research, our participants often reported that the situation had gotten much better. And that it was also largely a matter of ignorance and the fault of the mass media which spread a distorted vision of Islam. And finally, a rather significant portion, proportion of our participants reported that they themselves had never experienced such discrimination, even though most of, the, of these were also incontrovertibly members of visible minorities. Now, reconciling integration and difference by introducing religion. To this point, I have deliberately tried to paint a picture of a subpopulation, the children of relatively recent immigrants to Canada who were born or raised in that country, which in all but a few senses seem to be integrated, but about which it would be more accurate to say that they are and see themselves to be in great majority included in the society of which they are a part. There are quite a number of exceptions, of course, and certain subgroups, such as, for instance, those broadly speaking African or of Caribbean families, have on average and on average less positive experience than others. Nonetheless, in significant majority, this thus far appears to be the case. That said, in no way do I wish thereby to imply that the second generation is somehow just like anyone else in their generation and age cohorts in Canada. Above all, Canada's self-described and both officially and popularly much vaunted multi multiculturalism manifests itself among them in clear terms. If, on the one hand, one can say that they are just like anyone else, one must, also, one must also say that the great majority of them do this just like anyone else differently. And this not just because people are all different, the tremendous variety of outcomes to which I referred a few minutes ago, but very much according to the characteristics that identify them as different in the public multicultural discourse. Above all, differences of culture, for instance, South Asian, Chinese, Korean, Latin American, Caribbean, Arab, uh, Persian, to name but a few, and differences of religion. It is, of course, the latter on which I wish to focus here. In particular, I want now to talk about how the second generation see them, sees themselves and live their lives as religiously different while also being quote unquote integrated and included. It is this discussion that I had in mind when I gave this talk the title of when multiculturalism is not pillarization or ghettoization. Differences of religion and religious differences. As a point of departure in moving to this discussion, it is quite clear among these second and 1.5 genders that their orientation to religion varies in significant degree according to which religion one is talking about. Which religions or religions are those of the family heritage, are those with which they grew up. If, for instance, they come from a Hindu family, or a Muslim family, or a Buddhist family, or an Orthodox Christian family, then they are likely to see and do religion respectively in a Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, or Orthodox Christian way. By this, I of course mean much more than that they will identify with these religions, although that is part of it. Indeed, a significant number will not identify with them at all. Rather, it is the way they understand religion as such and the way that those who do identify and practice uh, make it part of their lives, sometimes the very center of their lives, that will vary roughly according to which religion is at issue. In addition, in a great many cases, a cultural component will be at play, meaning that they do religion according to their cultural background. Mostly, the two overlap. The different cultural ways of understanding and doing religion will correspond to the different religions. But sometimes, they will not. 
To explain this further, I move to some specific examples. I start with the Muslim, Muslim case. Doing religion differently through Islam. Judging from our research, Muslims are much more likely to see religion as a set of rules and a set of principles, above all ethical, ethical principles. These rules and principles structure all aspects of one's life, and they are fixed and more or less clear. In addition, religion is about community. It identifies a distinct and worldwide group. Even among the non-religious people who came from Muslim families, this is how they tended to understand what religion generally, and of course Islam specifically, is. Moreover, for almost all those who, who do identify as Muslim and practice Islam, and this is likely a significant majority, their understanding of Islam is centered on specific rules and principles, in particular the five pillars of Islam and moral virtues such as peacefulness, compassion for others, honesty, self sexual discipline, modesty, and humility. Almost invariably included in the rules are the typical dietary restrictions of no pork and no alcohol. To this must be added two further very common features. First, there is a very strong propensity to draw a clear distinction between religion and culture, especially the usually ethnically understood culture of their parents and religion, here Islam. Although they normally do not reject what they identify as the culture of their parents, and often find this culture an important part of their own identity, they will also try to identify and live what they, through their own efforts, have come to understand as true Islam without cultural accretions. Indeed, so much is this the case that quite a number of them will consider that as Canadians of the second generation, they are able to practice Islam better precisely because they more, can more readily see these illegitimate cultural accretions and purify their religious practice of them. Some will even go so far as to say that it is easier to be a good Muslim in Canada than in the country of their family origin. Others will not go this far, admitting that especially the temptations of the secular un-Islamic environment in Canada, but also a more, to a more minor extent the prejudice some, have, some people in this country have against their religion, makes this more challenging. Very few, however, complain about being excluded on the basis of their religion or that they do not have the freedom to practice it. The second feature I just mentioned is pa in passing, and that is the second feature I just mentioned in passing, and that is that they almost invariably take individual responsibility for deciding what Islam is and requires, meaning that they rarely, if ever, just carry on as Muslims because it is simply what they are by virtue of belonging to a particular family or another part of the world. And this is one of my main points. They want to be, and by their own claim, succeed in being Muslims in Canada not as people who somehow belong somewhere else and are mere sojourners there, but as normal people who happen to be and insist on being Muslim. This combination reflects itself in that the vast majority has mixed social circles. Their friends are of different cultural and often of different religious backgrounds and identities. They do not think that their being Muslim has anything necessary to say about where they will live, with whom they will socialize, and with whom they will found families, the latter, of course, with the significant exception that overwhelmingly mar marriage partners as eventual children must be Muslim. And in this respect, in spite of the mixed, mixed nature of their social networks, there is a decided propensity to spend more, time with one's, spend more of one's time with other Muslims, and this for religious reasons. Yet only a, for a small minority does this mean excluding oneself from the wider society. For most, it is just an outcome of one's religious practice and its importance in personal life. In a nutshell, then, this describes the prevailing way that they are different, here specifically and differentiatedly religiously, while at the same time being integrated into the wider society, a normal and included part of it, but in their particular Muslim or Islamic way. Doing religion differently through Hinduism. My second example. The most common pattern among those from Hindu families presents a distinct contrast. First, the understanding of religion as such shifts somewhat in that among them, on the one hand, it becomes more of a resource that is available when needed, but on the other hand, as Hinduism is woven into cultural life and cultural identity. This means that, in contrast to the most common way that Muslims understand their religion and use culture as a contrast to what their religion is all about, 
Hindus are more likely to do precisely the opposite. For a great many of them, there's hardly any, let alone a clear line between being Hindu culturally and being Hindu religiously, although all of them do make the distinction. Thus, being Hindu is taking part in family cultural life, replete with festivals, ceremonies, foodways, including often vegetarianism, days of fasting and the like. It includes artistic modes of expression, dance, music, Bollywood movies, and tight family networks and relations. The religiously Hindu is a part of that, but for a great many of these, this second generation, the religious quality of the rites and performances is not that important. One doesn't, for instance, partake in the temple ceremony or the puja at the family shrine at home in order to express one's devotion to the gods. One does it because it's a part of what it means to be a member of this family and its culture. In addition, for those who do take the religious dimension of being Hindu seriously, this is more often done with the awareness that even the celebrations of the wide variety of ways that this can be done. Sorry, I misread that. In addition, for those who do take the religious dimension of being Hindu seriously, this is more often done with the awareness and even the celebration of the wide variety of ways that this can be done under the Hindu umbrella. As one participant put it, par participant put it I've got a hundred ways of doing my religion. Nonetheless, like most of the Muslims, there is also an insistence on figuring things out for themselves. To a certain degree, one partakes just because that is what we do as Hindus in our family. But there is also a wish to understand, to have explanations, and to choose for oneself what is valid and worth doing, especially as concerns the religiously Hindu dimension. This individual responsibility for how one is to be religious, those from a Hindu family share with those from Muslim families. What they also share is that combination of insisting on being religiously different, here more accurately, religio-culturally different, celebrating that difference, and to a certain extent, hanging with their own to express that difference. Yet at the same time, doing this while seeking and being actively included and quote-unquote integrated in the wider society. Being Hindu their way does not require and expressly eschews any kind of staying among one's own, except as a key aspect of one's private family and community life. To this corresponds, as it does with the Muslims, the almost total absence of any thought that one could actually be a better Hindu somewhere else. That how things are in Canada is acceptable, but it would be better if we were, quote unquote, back home. Indeed, the majority of the Hindu participants in our research had hardly ever been back home. And among those that had been, even regularly, they rarely held any wish to be there on a more permanent basis, say perhaps because they felt that they didn't belong, that they belonged there more. Now to the Buddhists. Buddhism as partial identity, a third variant. When it comes to those who came to our research because they came from a Buddhist family or family background, what I've just described as the prevailing pattern for the Hindus becomes even more pronounced. Stated briefly, if for the Hindus being Hindu culturally involves being Hindu religiously, but, but the religious dimension is more often not, than not, uh, is more, is more often not of particular importance, for those of Buddhist families, the Buddhism is generally recognized only as a religious component of one's identity, not as often as a cultural one. And that it is only a partial component, the dominant one being cultural. What this means more precisely depends to a significant degree on the ethnic background in question. Allow me to explain. The majority of those in Canada who identify as Buddhist, and especially of those who have a Buddhist background, are ethnically Chinese including ethnically Chinese from Southeast Asia. In other words, the ethnically Chinese come from China, including Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Macau, but they also come from Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Singapore, Malaysia, and so forth. For most of the second generation from these families, being Buddhist, to the extent that they even consider themselves personally as Buddhist, is a component of being Chinese. To such an extent that what is understood as Buddhist may have little to do with what most of us would understand in a Buddhism. Often the understanding of Buddhism amount, amounts to no more than a sense of that Buddhism is the source of good moral values. Or, as one particular uh, participant put it, when asked how she expressed her Buddhist identity, uh, she said, people say that I'm very tolerant. Indeed, the majority understanding of religion among these Buddhists, quote unquote, is more as something vaguely, vaguely sectarian that particular religious groups practice among themselves, 
um, than it is than is something universal in which they are also implicated. In this context, a significant number have a negative attitude to what they see as quote unquote pushy religion, their word. Namely, one that, like evangelical Protestant Christianity, to which many of their co-ethnics belong, seeks to spread itself, claims to be the center of a way of life, and refuses, refuses to stay in the background, unassuming but comforting, like their Buddhism. Some go as far as to say that they are pleased, they, that they are pleased to identify themselves with a truly nice and tolerant religion, in contrast to at least some of the other religions around them. This sort of Buddhism is, of course, hardly going to get in the way of participating fully in the surrounding society, and it doesn't. Nonetheless, given that part Buddhism is for most of them only a part of their broader cultural identity, the more important component is in fact the expressly cultural one, whether it is being Chinese or Sri Lankan or Vietnam, Vietnamese culturally, or others. Thus, just as family and ethnic networks is of central importance uh, for many of the Hindus, so is this the case for many of the Buddhists, except that here the network is not religiously identified, only as having religious here, component, here, here Buddhist component. Quite as much as the Muslims and the Hindus, therefore, these second generers of Buddhist background also have an important part of their lives that involves only their own group. But again, not to the exclusion of regular involvement in the wider society and cultural milieu. One could say, in a nutshell, that these second generers are Chinese, Vietnamese, etc., Buddhist and Canadian, just as the Muslims are Muslim and Canadian, and the Hindus are Hindu and Canadian. This is their own words to a large extent. Mutatis mutandis, this could apply to for such second generation people in other countries, and then only the designation of what one is in addition to being Chinese, Muslim, Hindu would change. That depends, of course, to what degree such a combination is recognized, allowed, or encouraged in, a, encouraged in another country setting. Now to summary and conclusions. These examples could be multiplied. I could do the same sort of analysis for second generation Sikhs, or Catholic, Protestant, or Orthodox Christians. In fact, I was tempted to do so, but I realized it was getting too long. And with comparable outcomes. Namely, this combination of being religiously different without the impl implication that this means keeping inordinately among one's own, let alone feeling that somehow one, belo one belongs elsewhere. They appear to feel no, no need for a pillar, to be shielded in as many parts of their lives as, mu uh, uh, as much as possible from the surrounding others, as a condition for being and living as they are. They are also in no sense ghettoized. If by that we mean that most of their lives take place in a particular circumscribed place, one characterized, characterized by the dominance of their particular group and by a high degree of marginalization from the rest of society. Indeed, the great majority of them explicitly reject such possibilities and complain, for instance, that some of their fellows, and they here they mean predominantly some of those in the parental first generation, keep to themselves too much, and that this is neither right nor healthy. <laughs> Even when, and in many cases, although, in great, uh, although a great many of them do in fact live uh, uh, in particular parts of the large cities where their group is disproportionately represented, so-called ethnic enclaves, this is not regarded as being hived off, largely for the practical reasons that there are always different kinds of people in their, uh, than their own also living in these areas, and most importantly, because there are in most cases, remember we're talking about the large cities here, quite vast parts of these cities and therefore can hardly be called enclaves anymore than the neighborhoods and districts where the older population are the largest major majority group. I'll give you an example. For instance, if you want to talk about Chinese enclaves in Toronto, uh, the area that you have to draw is half the size of the city. Uh, it's that big. And on the other side, there's what is uh, jokingly called Brown Town. Uh, and it's, it's huge. It's, 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 it's Hanover would fit into it about three times. Uh, it's, it's that big. Remember, North American cities are spread. So that's what I mean. Is if you're going to call about, talk about ethnic enclaves, when does an ethnic enclave get too big to be called an enclave? Uh, by that stroke, Toronto is an enclave. Still, they are concent residentially concentrated more than the, the, the rest of the population. Moreover, 
they very often express this attitude explicitly in terms of multiculturalism. Remember, you have to understand in Canada, we believe our own myth, right? Um, the vast majority approves of this idea, often con considers themselves as truly Canadian because they already manifest this in their persons, in their persons, this multiculturalism. In other words, I don't have to change, I'm already Canadian because I'm different, that kind of thing. And they are critical of multiculturalism in Canada to the extent that it does not mean precisely the integrated co-presence of different cultural and religious identities which they themselves try to live. It is for them not multiculturalism if differences li just live juxtaposed side by side, in other words, pillarized, uh, whether in enclaves, pillars, ghettos or not. No, multiculturalism for the vast majority of this population means interaction learning from each other, having something to do with one another, living together, and yet in such a way that the differences are maintained, respected, and lived as a matter of natural course. All of this, of course, paints a rather rosy picture. And my constant use of terms like mostly, majority, by and large, predominantly, and there are exceptions, is meant to qualify this rosiness and, pl and implicitly include the idea that much of this is an expression of how it should be, uh, how one would like it to be, and not always how it is. Nonetheless, that qualifier should also not detract from the conclusion that, in general, this integrated picture is precisely how it is, or at least how these sub subpopulations actually see it to be. And this last is, I believe, critical, and leads me to my conclude concluding statement. The question of immigrant integration, in particular in the second generation, is to a great extent one of perception and valuation. Unlike the measures of inclusion, which point to real conditions and situations, the matter of integration is to a great degree a matter of seeing. If one sees them as belonging here, if they see themselves as belonging here, if they feel themselves as recognized as belonging here, then that is already halfway, but only halfway to making that belonging a practical social reality. The question of whether such seeing and recognizing requires an entire rethinking of the question of national identity, I will leave for another time. Thank you. Ganz bestimmt. Versuch sogar auf Deutsch zu beantworten, dass ich nicht mehr lese. Well, that shut you up. <laughs> Sorry. Geht auch. <laughs> 